So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to creating a 12-week major gift donor campaign. My name is Hillary Clark. I work for me a regional technical assistance project about South Advocacy. The NEED project is managed by Green Mountain South Advocates, the state South Advocacy organization in Vermont. Today's presentation is our third webinar with Andy Robinson. We are recording this webinar. We will be adding, you will be able to find the recording of this webinar as well as Andy's previous webinars in this series on the NEAT website. Hi, do you want to introduce Andy now? I'd love to. You want to flip to the next slide? Cool. Hi, my name is Sky Peebles. I work at Green Mountain Self Advocates and I work on the NEAT project with Hillary. And I'm very excited to introduce Andy Robinson, who is our presenter this afternoon. And Andy has been working for over 35 years with lots of different nonprofits as a facilitator, a trainer, a fundraiser, um, and started doing consulting in 1995. And he has worked with thousands of nonprofit staff and volunteers in almost all 50 states and across Canada. And he specializes in lots, uh, lots of different organizational types, like organizations that work with human rights, social justice, the environment, community development. And he has a great um, set of skills and ideas to share with us. And he also has lots of resources that he's going to point us to towards the end of the webinar. So we're really excited. Thank you, Andy. And I'll hand it back to you. Lovely. So, uh, Hillary, next slide, please. And before we start, I want to thank uh, Hillary. I want to thank Sky. I want to thank all their colleagues at uh, Green Mountain Self Advocates. And of course, there is the Northeast Network, and many of you come in from there. So, thank you for participating. Thank you for your work, and thank you for your help. So, a couple logistical things. We will um, send you handouts and the slide deck when this is over. Uh, one of the there's an exercise associated with this that we're going to send to you. Um, so you'll have that stuff. It's available also as download. Um, we are going to take questions from the chat box, and then we'll do our best to open it up at the end for uh, spoken questions. If we have everybody on the call unmuted, it gets pretty loud and hard to hear, even if nobody's talking. There's a lot of background noise. Um, so you're going to be muted, but we will give you a chance to chat later. In the meantime, feel free to use the chat box. Uh, both Sky and I will be keeping an eye on that to try and answer your questions as they come up. And we do encourage questions and or comments. So next slide, please, Hillary. Our topic today is a major gift fundraising campaign. And in a minute, we'll talk about the word major. Um, it shouldn't be intimidating to you because you decide what the word major means. And the idea here is that this is a season when you all get together and identify potential donors, go out and talk to them, ask for their support, and you do it in an organized, structured way. So let's get a sense of where you are now. Next slide, please. And for the next three slides, we're going to be putting up some polls to get a sense of how you, where you stand now, what the baseline is for your respective organization. So the question here is, do you meet with donors and ask for gifts? And, and what's working? What hasn't? What hasn't worked? Maybe what have you learned in the process? So Hillary, go ahead and put up the poll, please. The first poll is about, are you actually out talking to people in person? And the question is this, how often do you meet with donors to ask for gifts? Uh, you, get, you get to select one. We frequently meet with donors to ask. Uh, second option is we occasionally meet with donors to ask. Third option is we rarely meet with donors for ask. And the fourth option is what are you talking about? We've never done this. So um, do you actually sit down and schedule appointments and look people in the face and ask them to support you financially? That's the question here. So you get to vote for one of these. Please go ahead and do that. And we'll give you a, a minute or two on this. And uh, then we'll, we'll see how you're doing on this one. It is worth noting, and we're going to get into this in a minute, is that this is probably the scariest way to raise money, but it's also the most effective way to raise money. You get the biggest gifts in person, and you get the highest percentage of people saying yes in person. All right, Hillary, let's see what the poll looks like, if you can give us the answers. Please. Okay, mm, 
there we go. Uh, we frequently meet with donors to ask 8%. We occasionally meet 25%. These are decent numbers. We rarely meet 8%. We've never done this 58% of the people on the call. So I'm guessing many of you are on this call because you want to learn how to do it. For those of you who have some expertise, that's awesome. OK, so close the poll. We're going to do a little sort of sliding around between screens here. And then go to the next slide, please. So the word major can be intimidating. And when I say major gifts, many people think, oh, well, that's rich people who have fancy cars and big houses, and I don't know any of those people, and they put their names on buildings, and those are not our donors. And you know, I have to say, the word major is your call. Um, the amount is up to you. One thing to think about is the fact that most Americans give money. 70% of the population are donors. Uh, 7 out of 10 people that you know give to charitable organizations. And it's worth noting that these percentages are higher as you go down the income scale. Um, poor people give away more money as a percentage of what they have than the wealthy do. Second note here is that um, when we add up what people give, and most people give to multiple nonprofits, when we add it up, median household giving, so median is halfway between the top and the bottom, it's right in the middle, median household giving is between $1,300 and $2,000 per year when you add up people's gifts. So that's a pretty big number. The thing to pay attention to is, first of all, how many people can you actually get out and talk to? Because everybody on this call, I'm assuming, is pretty busy. This is time-consuming stuff, and you have to make choices about how you use your time. So number one limiting factor is how many asks are realistic for your organization. The second limiting factor is how many people can you stay in touch with after they give? How many relationships can you manage? And most of the work in fundraising is not the asking. It's the stuff you do before you ask and the stuff you do after to engage people both before and after they give. So for the sort of groups on this call, my advice is that you set a major gift level somewhere in the range of $250, $500, and up from there. And again, for some of you, that may sound like a big number, and, and I'm OK with that. You need to understand that $250 works out to 20 bucks a month. $500 works out to about $40 a month. And that's pretty affordable for a pretty wide range of people. So what I'm suggesting here is there are probably more major donors out there, depending on how you define the word major, than you realize. So our second poll is about, and Hillary, go ahead and put up the poll here. Um, the second poll is about where you might draw the line for your organization. We're interested in what you would consider a large gift from an individual donor. Here are your options, $100, $250, $500, $1,000, or perhaps $2,500 or higher. And I guess the question I'm asking is, when you open the mail or you go online and you see a donation and you, know, you pull the check out of the envelope, what amount has to come out of that envelope for you to do your little happy dance and get really excited, like, oh, this is a big check. We're really happy about this. So that's the question I'm asking. And pick a number that would be a significant gift for your organization from an individual donor. And this is always an interesting question to me because you know it really depends on the scale of the organization. There are certainly universities and hospitals that they would start their major gift number much higher than what you're seeing on the screen. But for a lot of grassroots groups, you know any of these numbers could be significant. All right, Hillary, when you are ready, pull up the results, please, because I'm curious to see where people land on this. All right. 100 bucks and up is a big gift for us, 17%. 250 and up is a big gift, 25%. 500 and up, 33%. 1,000, 8%. $2,500 or higher, 17%. So we got a pretty good range here, and I think that's I think that's really helpful. Um, we can go ahead and close the poll, please. And you know what I'm going to teach you on this webinar will be relevant regardless of where you where you set that number because the principles are the same and the process is pretty much the same. All right, we'll go to the next slide. And this one is about the 12 weeks part. Now, it's worth noting there's two ways you can do major donor fundraising. You can do it throughout the year. 
you can be identifying donors all the time, getting them excited about your work all the time, asking them as you have the time to do it, thanking them, recognizing them, involving them. All of that can go on throughout the year, and that's great. There is another model, which is we try and structure this in a way where it's, it's pushed into a smaller period of time. And we call this a campaign. And as it says here on the slide, it allows you to set goals, create a calendar, build momentum, and hold people accountable. Deadlines are good. Um, deadlines make us do better work often. And this is a way to create a deadline around some work that you may not be doing or may frankly be avoiding. 12 weeks is not magic. Um, I know a client that does all of this in two weeks, twice a year. The first week is uh, training and phone calling and training and phone calling. The purpose of the phone calls is to set up appointments. And then in the second week, they go out and they do meetings. And they do three or four a day. And so again, 12 weeks isn't magic. But time limited may work for some of you. Now we have another poll question. Please put it up, Hillary. And I want you to think about if you were to try and do this during one quarter of the year, one season of the year, when would it work best for you given other commitments that you have? And this may have to do with when you think your donors are available or when you might have time to do it um, or when there are fewer conflicts in your organizational schedule. But if we are talking about a time-limited fundraising campaign, what's the right time for you? So we have the options. We have spring, summer, fall, winter. I'm, I'm being sort of, I'm not setting specific months because we can be flexible on this. But it's worth thinking about when this might work best for you, given your other commitments that you have organizationally. And I'm, I'm, there's not a right answer or a wrong answer. If you do it any of these times, it's good. There may be a better season, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So, Hillary, let's see what people said. Spring, 46%. Summer, 15%. Fall, 23%. Winter, 15%. So here's the thing I will tell you. When we study when people give, most nonprofits find that they get more than 50% of their income from individuals in the last quarter of the year, from October through December. A lot of people tend to give near the end of the year. So there's sort of good news and bad news here. Good news is if you can get organized to do it at the end of the year, um, people tend to be more generous then. The bad news is you have more competition then because a lot of other people are asking at that time. So I would say whenever you can get it together to do it is the best time. Okay. We can close the poll and let's go to the next slide, please. And I want to thank everybody for weighing in. Those are, the, those are our poll questions for today. Henceforth, if you have questions, please, please use the chat box. Chat them in. We'll do our best to answer them. So, and it's, sorry, I am, is, can yeah, I go ahead. A, I have a quick question about the training that you mentioned that the other organization you worked with does. So what kind of training do people do, or, or is that something that you'll touch on? Like, how would you sort of get your game face ready for something like this? Yeah, so stick around. We'll get there. OK. okay? I definitely have some content on that. I'm going to do it in sequence, but please make sure I do. Um, so the other thing to say here is that face-to-face -face is beneficial for two reasons. Number one, this is not about money. This is about relationships. And this is sort of the key wisdom about fundraising, is that if the money gets ahead of the relationships, you have a problem. So. The idea of sitting down and chatting with someone, it's not just a pitch or you talking about how great your organization is. You need to do that. But it's a conversation. It's asking questions. It's listening. It's finding out how people, what's the word, how people intersect with your mission. Like what's in their experience that makes your work relevant and important to them. And frankly, when we meet with donors, more than anything else, we want to have them do the talking. I mean, there's a sense that we're supposed to show up and entertain them. And no, I think, I think you show up with questions, and you ask those questions, and you have a conversation. The second thing you need to know is that people will typically give you five to 10 times more money in person than they will send you through the mail. And you know, doing the math here, if you have somebody who sends you $100 when you do your year-end annual appeal, they mail you $100. They are probably a $500 to $1,000 prospect if you can get in to see them. 
And the key word there is if, because not everybody wants to meet with you. Most people don't. But you know, the general math is if you start with 10 people who are good prospects for your organization, meaning they have some relationship with the organization or with you personally, and you send them a letter, you call them up, and you say, hi, I want to meet with you. I want to tell you about the organization. I want to learn more about you. I want to ask for your support. So this is a fundraising meeting, just so we're clear. If you start with 10 people, something like two out of three of those 10 will say, yes, let's meet. Seven out of eight, seven or eight people out of 10 that you want to meet with, they don't want to meet with you. Because most people don't want to have a face-to-face -face conversation where you're asking them for money. This, this won't surprise you. The thing about those two or three people who say yes is they know you're coming for money. They know it's about that. They're already interested enough to say yes to a meeting. So what you're doing here is you're screening out the folks who aren't that interested, and you're meeting with the ones who are. And for that reason, your success on these meetings is going to be really high. 80 to 90% of the people you meet with will give you money if they know in advance that it's a fundraising conversation. And some of those other people, they might mail you a check or they might, you know, come to your event. But the amount you get in person is bigger. And frankly, it justifies the effort it takes. Okay. So let's get into sort of the nuts and bolts of how we're going to structure this. Go to the next slide, please. So the thing about the, do we go backwards? Yeah, it went backwards. Go forwards, please. <laughs> the other direction. There we go. Bingo. So before we start here, I'm, I'm going to lay out a process for you that has, I believe, eight steps in it. And they're, they're listed in the slides, and we'll give you the slide deck later. Before you begin, this is like step zero. You want to clarify why people might give to you. So the three questions here are, you know, why would someone give? What, what, are you, what are you doing that's unique or special or important? Second thing is, is what are you working on? What's the value of the work? Why, why is the work necessary? And third is, why is the gift needed right now? If somebody gives, what impact will it have? And this can be a writing exercise. This can be you sitting around with your team and just trying to answer these questions, everybody writing down answers, comparing notes. And you could put it together into a one-pager. It doesn't have to be a 20-page big document. It can be one page. And it simply says, here's why we are out asking for money now. And here's why our organization is valuable. And you might want to support it. Next slide. So we're going to get into the realm of math here. And if you, if you, if you find math scary, I totally understand. Bear with me, because this isn't complicated, and it goes pretty quick. When we are raising money from people, we track two sets of numbers. We track how many people give. That's the donors. And we track how much money they give. That's the dollars. We have donors. We have dollars. Typically, it looks like this. Typically, 10% of the donors give us 60% of the money that we're trying to raise. The next 20% of the donors give 20% of the money. And everybody else, these are the smaller donors. There's 70% of the people, they're only 20% of the money. So if you're going to be smart about this, you set a goal for your campaign, and then you take out your calculator, and you figure out how many gifts you need at different levels that, that are going to add up to that goal. And I have a couple of samples for you. Go to the next slide, please. What I'm going to show you is a couple of gift pyramids or gift charts. And this one's actually sort of clever because it's in the shape of a pyramid. It's got one of those Mayan pyramids here. Uh, this is borrowed from the Iowa chapter of the Sierra Club. And three columns here, number of donors, gift amount, money raised. So one donor giving $5,000, that's $5,000. Two donors giving $2,500 each, that's another $5,000. Five donors giving $1,000 each, yay, it's another $5,000. Then they've got 10 at $750, and they have 30 at 500 So you'll notice the range of gifts they're looking for is from 500 to 5000 They need 48 gifts. I'm at the bottom of the slide here. And when you add up the money, that's $37,500. That's their goal for this campaign. And in a way, this is a, a reality test. Because after you create this chart and you're working with your planning team, you sit down and you say, OK, 
who do we know that might give $5,000? Is there anybody we could ask for that lead gift? And the anybody could be an individual. I suppose it could be a business or a foundation, corporation. But there needs to be somebody at the top of the pyramid, as we say. And then you say, well, who, do, who could we ask for 2500 Who could we ask for 1000 And this is a way to reality test your goal. Because if you have this goal, but you don't have any names next to these numbers, potential people to talk to, then your goal probably isn't realistic. And I would say, as a general rule, because of what I told you earlier, you need at least two or three people for each gift you're going to get. So they need 48 total donors. They're going to have to generate a list of 100 to 150 prospects in order to be pretty close to guaranteeing that they can reach their goal. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here's another sample of this. Um, this is from a group called the Five Valleys Land Trust. They had a twenty-five, excuse me, $250,000 challenge campaign. A donor had given them $250,000 on the condition they raise another $250,000 in new money. And this is a slightly more complicated chart, but it basically comes to the same place. The first column is how many gifts do we need. Second column is gifts or pledges in hand. The third column is the amount, how much. And you'll notice these are ranges. They're not specific dollar amounts. Category total, that's how many when you add them up. And then the cumulative, tough word to say, is each, each line added to the subsequent line. So you know, just checking this off, they need five gifts at the top level. Notice that two pieces are inked in. That means they have two commitments of anywhere from $10,000 to $25,000. This is a way to track progress on the campaign. But you can also use this with donors. You can physically hand this to somebody during a donor meeting and say, we are trying to raise $250,000. You will notice that we have raised about $130,000 so far, so we're doing pretty well. We have giving options here at every level. We are seeking gifts of $500 all the way up to $25,000. Obviously, it's a big range. And then you can say to the donor, how much would you like to give? So the beauty of this chart is it's both an organizing principle. It helps you structure the campaign. But you can also use it when you're talking to donors. You can use it as a tool for asking for money. You can show them the chart and say, where do you see yourself on this chart? So step one is setting a goal and building a chart. And um, we've got two samples here. Happy to send you more samples if you need them. Next slide, please. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a calendar. And I've, I've already prepared this for you as a handout. We will send it to you. This is one version. I don't want to say there's a correct version. And this is actually spread over two slides. It's spread over 12 weeks. It's got everything from setting a goal to identifying p people who will go out and talk to donors and training those people, uh, scheduling appointments, meeting with donors, sending thank you notes a celebration at the end, all of those things. And this is my version of what optimal looks like. You will probably find when you start to build a calendar that you'll drop some of these tasks, you will add some others, and they'll move around on the calendar. That's fine. And I'm actually going to show you this again at the end of the webinar. It's in here twice. So this is the first six weeks. Hillary, give me the next slide, please. And then we've got the final weeks, which is weeks 7 through 12. Um, please note that one of the last tasks here is we have a party on week 11. We have a celebration. And then we evaluate, and we identify who's going to help organize the next campaign, which is good. Because you know, once you're out of this, you think, all right, what do we, what do we learn? And if we're going to do this again, who's going to take the lead? So you can use my version of the calendar. You can create your own. But if we're going to do this in 12 weeks, we really need some structure in terms of what happens week by week. This is one model for that. Next slide. So again, so far, we've set a goal and built a gift chart. We've created a calendar. Now we're going to talk about materials. You don't need a lot of fancy materials to do this. You don't have to go out and get full color brochures. I mean, if you have them and you want to use them, that's great. But that's not required here. You need some internal stuff. The internal stuff are tracking forms, meaning who is assigned to which donor? Have they completed the phone calls? Have they scheduled the appointments? Have they met with the donor? Did the donor say yes? Did the donor say no? Is there any follow-up we have to do? Did you get a check? How much was the check? So that's a tracking form. 
Training materials we'll talk a little more about, but this is basically the things you need to teach people to go out and ask successfully. And then maybe you need phone scripts for people who are making phone calls to schedule appointments. I mean, you don't necessarily need that, but scripts are helpful for people who haven't done it before. External, you might think you might need letters to send out to donors the process in a bit, but the letter is, says, hi, we're doing this campaign and we're scheduling appointments and I'd love to meet with you and I will be calling you soon to schedule time for us to meet. You don't have to send the letter, but it's a step that's helpful to people. Uh, FAQ stands for Frequently Asked Questions, and maybe you do a one-pager that would be helpful for your solicitors to have. And then maybe you have other printed pitch materials, like maybe you have that gift chart we talked about, maybe you have brochures, photographs. Uh, I suppose you could do a short video if you wanted to. Uh, don't go crazy here, because the materials will not make or break your campaign. Next slide. So, um, Sky, this one's for you. <laughs> We need to do some training. And we need to first identify people to train. Who is going to go out and talk to donors? And I would suggest there are several potential groups of people. Certainly your board members could help with this. I didn't put staff in here. I see no reason why staff can't participate, so we can add them as well. Committee members, other volunteers, loyal donors, who anyone who is passionate about the organization, who is enthusiastic, and is willing to do this. And it's worth noting that when we go meet with donors, if you have the people to do it, it's often helpful to go in pairs. And, and a good pair is a staff member going with a board member or a volunteer. And it's a little more work to get to organize the logistics of going out in pairs, but it's, it's important because A, you'll feel smarter and stronger and more confident if you have somebody with you. Uh, but also, I mean, two people know more than one person. It's um, there's a better chance that one of you will resonate with the donor, will have some some commonality, and it's good for your donors to know multiple people involved with the organization. We want to share those relationships. So the second bullet here is provide training, and usually what we're doing is we're getting people in the room and we're teaching them the structure of the conversation, and then we're doing role plays. And I'm actually going to walk you through the structure of the conversation. I believe I have those slides in here. Yes, I do. So I'll talk you through that soon. Um, but you know what we're doing is we're getting people in the room, usually for at least an evening, a couple of hours at minimum. And we're saying, OK, here's the process. Like Here's how the campaign works. Here's the calendar. And your job is you're going to be talking to a certain number of donors. And then you assign prospects, or maybe people pick their own prospects. And you teach them about how to do the donor conversation. And then they practice with each other. And you know, I, I say the word role play, and people cringe. But it's really the best way to learn how to do this is to practice with a, practice with a partner or two. And then where it says here is uh, lines of accountability. And that simply means who is responsible to who. If, if five people who are going out and doing donor visits who do they report to? I mean, is there somebody who's chairing the campaign and they call afterward and they say, all right, I did my visits and here's what happened? So you need to have some structure so that people know where to send the money, where to give the information, uh, who's responsible for putting stuff into a database, that sort of thing. All right, next slide, please. So we want to identify people that we're going to ask. And this is the classic definition of the word prospect. It's a fundraising word, and it simply means somebody that you would like to approach and to ask to give. ABC makes it easy to remember. A stands for ability. Now, ability says, do they have money to give? It is worth noting that ability is not wealth. And you know, as I noted earlier, depending on where you draw the line on your minimum gift for your campaign, if you're going $250, that's 20 bucks a month. If you're going $500, that's $40 a month. I mean, these are not huge numbers. I believe there's quite a few people who could afford gifts of those size. So don't assume you have to find wealthy people. It's the biggest mistake that people make when they do this. Um, stop looking for wealth. Start looking at your neighbors. B is belief. Do they care? Are they connected in some way to the work of your organization? And C is contact. Do you have some way to get to them? Is there a relationship with this person? It is worth noting that in order of importance, BC is upside down. The contact, the relationship, the access is number one. 
Belief is number two. How much money they have, the one about ability, it's the least important of the three. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit around with lists, and maybe you have a previous you know, lists of current donors that you want to look at and see, are there, is there anyone on our list right now that we would like to try and meet with and ask them to give more? So I guess the word would be upgrade. Is there anyone we'd like to upgrade? You can ask people to bring their own phones and their own tablets and spend some time paging through the names, saying, is there anybody that you know that you'd be comfortable approaching? A third thing you can do is collect lists from peer organizations. So you know, you may operate in a community or in a state where there are a variety of organizations that are engaged with the disability community, many of these organizations publish their donor lists on their websites, in their newsletters, their annual reports. You can collect those things. You can bring them to the prospect meeting, and you can pass the lists around and say, here are some people who already give to brother and sister nonprofits. Do we know any of these folks? Are they worth approaching for our organization? And in that case, you've met the ABC criteria. A, do they have ability? Yes, they're giving to another nonprofit, so they should have some ability. B, do they believe? Well, they, they're giving to a group that you would consider a peer or a partner. So yeah, they believe. C, contact, does anybody know them? And if you meet these three criteria, that's someone you should try and approach. It's important to help your team think like prospects. Now, if you already have a list and you want to just start with your own donors and try and talk to them, that's a great place to start. And maybe that's all the bandwidth you have, is let's go to the 20 people who are most generous to our organization already and see if we can get them to give a little more. And if that's what this boils down to for you, that's awesome, and that's a really good place to start. All right, next slide. So. We've talked about this a little bit here. Um, we start with our current donors. You want to rate them. So this is how much you think they can give, but also, I think more importantly, the strength of your relationship with, the organi with their organization, excuse me, the strength of their relationship with you personally or the organization. And I have to say, I mean, the strength of the relationship trumps the amount of money always. It's really all about how connected are they to the work you're doing? And then you set amounts for each one. Like, all right, let's get a sense of who. Let's go talk to Joe, and maybe we should ask him for $500. Or let's go talk to Sally and ask her for $2,000. Or let's go talk to Martha and ask her for $500. And, and that's fine. If you're uncomfortable picking an amount, you can say, let's go um, talk to Juanita, and we'll show her the gift chart, and we'll let her pick the amount. And that's also a fine answer to that. And then the assignments is where this either makes or breaks. I mean, you got this list, and then the question is, who's going to talk to whom? And hopefully some people raise their hand and say, I will talk to so-and-so. If nobody raises their hand and nobody wants to talk to anybody, then at that point, the campaign is essentially over. So recruit people that you think are willing to follow through and are trainable and have enough enthusiasm and enough courage that they'll actually do this. Next slide. So step six here is to start to engage people. And classically, there is the three-step model. These are the three bullets here. You send a letter or perhaps an email requesting a meeting. And it can be a, a you know, if it's an email, it's a paragraph or two. If it's a letter, it's two or three paragraphs. It's not long. It basically says, we are scheduling outreach to our most loyal donors. And we want to come and talk to you about increasing your support. And maybe you name the campaign goal. I would put in a little bit about what you're working on that might be exciting to people. And then you say, I'll be calling you to schedule an appointment when we can sit down together. And to be very clear, you wouldn't put an envelope in this letter because you don't want people to mail you back a check. You want to meet with them. And the reason you want to meet with them is the stuff we've already talked about. You're going to strengthen the relationship and you're going to raise more money. So don't think about this as a fundraising letter. Think about this as an appointment setting letter. The goal is to set an appointment. Now you could skip the letter and just go straight to email and or phone and pick up the phone and say, you know, hey Francine, how are you? I am scheduling, scheduling meetings with our best donors and I'd love to come and talk with you about what we're doing 
and ask for your support. And if you're comfortable doing that, that's fine. And the advantage of the letter is it gives people a little advance warning, but either way is good. And then the third step is you meet with them. And some people will say, you know, you don't have to drive over here. What do you need? Why don't we just do this on the phone? And it's your choice to say, yes, I'd like to come and see you, or no, um, I agree, let's, let's do this on the phone. So your decision. I will say you get more money in person, you deepen the relationship better in person, it's more work to go there. In some cases we're talking cars, we may be talking public transit, or just bicycling or walking down the street, I guess it depends on the distances. Uh, but when in doubt, go for the meeting, because the meetings are more successful. So let's go to seven, please, excuse me, the next slide. I want to talk to you specifically about how we structure the meeting, and this is spread over two slides as well. First thing you're going to do is you're going to build some rapport. This is chit chat. How's the family? Oh, I saw you put in a garden this year. What'd you grow? Oh, I heard you went on a trip. How was your trip? And this is the basic stuff we do. Nice weather we're having. Don't spend a huge amount of time on this. I mean, unless you're there for the afternoon and you're you got the tea and the cookies and the pictures of the grandchildren. But in general, you want to do a little rapport building, and then you want to move to item two here, which is stating your goals for the meeting. And I would always say it's basically three things. It's I'm here to learn more about you. I'm here to tell you what we've been doing. And I'm here to ask for your gift. This is a fundraising meeting. And the advantage of doing this is you've just sort of taken control of the meeting. And everybody knows where you're going. It's very clear. And, and there's no surprises. Item three is the most important item. And it's the one we tend to forget. Why does the donor care? Uh, what's his or her connection to your organization and your work? And the tendency, especially if you're new, you show up to do these meetings and you start talking about the organization and the mission and the programming, and it's, you know, it's a monologue. It's just you talking, and that's a big error. So we want to let the, let the donor talk first, and the way that we do that is we ask questions. So you might say to the donor, um, you know, uh, Elmer, you have been giving to our group for 30 years, which is amazing, and we're so grateful. Thank you for your support. And you may not be aware of it, but I added up your donations, and you've given seven, several thousand dollars over the years. And then I, I want to know, why do you give us that money? I mean, why is this work important to you? Why do you care about us? So the magic word here is dialogue. You've got to get the other person to talk. If you do all the talking, you're going to go down in flames. <laughs> so. Please ask questions. If needed, bring those questions with you. Prepare them in advance. Bring them along. Ask them. Next slide. So number four here is the presentation, or perhaps the word pitch. It's you talking about why your, why your work is valuable and why somebody should care. A couple of notes. First of all, it's good to tell your own story. I think this is the place to tell it, why you're involved, why you care. Second note is keep it brief. I mean, we oversell, we over talk. And you really want to be as concise as you possibly can. The third note is if you have anything visual to bring with you, like if you have photos, apps, or anything that tells your story visually, that's good. Um, some people are visual learners. They like to look at stuff. So don't feel like this is a requirement. But if you have those things already, bring them with you. Then we get to number five, which is asking for the gift. And you have two options here. You can pull out that gift chart that we've already talked about, and you can hand it to the donor. And you can say, we're looking for a range of gifts here. And you'll see on the chart the low is 500 or whatever your low is, and our high is whatever your high is. And then you can say to the donor, to be honest, I have no idea how much to ask you for. So I'm going to let you decide. I mean, look at these numbers and pick the one that would work best for you. Please be as generous as you can. And that's one strategy, and I think that works great. Another strategy is to pick a number and say, OK, uh, Martha, we were hoping you would consider a gift of $1,000. That would be really significant for us. What do you say? And the, the great wisdom here is you ask for the money, and you look the donor in the eye, and then you close your mouth. <laughs> you shut up. And I don't mean to be harsh, but there is a strong tendency in that moment to start backpedaling and apologizing. And don't do it. Just ask. And, and wait. You know, drink your tea or whatever you need to do to distract yourself, but wait. 
And you're either going to get a yes or a no or a maybe let me think about it. Those are the only answers to that question. So very brief, yes, I encourage you to celebrate, get happy. Um, if you like to cry at good news, <laughs> it's time to cry, perfectly fine. And then you want to figure out the details. And this is where I encourage people to bring a pledge form with them so you can take it out and fill it out. And the pledge form includes things like, how do I spell your name? And OK, how much would you like to give? Let me make sure I write the correct amount down. And oh, it says terms of payment. Are you writing me a check today? Are you sending one in? Am I doing a credit card? How do you want to do this? Oh, can we recognize you? Is it OK to use your name? Or would you rather be anonymous? Those sorts of things. So yes is good. You will get some yeses. And, and by all means, celebrate. If somebody says no, generally they tell you why. And I just want you to listen to the no and see if there's something there to work with. Because usually, I mean, sometimes the no is, I'm not interested. And I think you have to be gracious and say thank you and, and leave. But often no is not no in the sense somebody might say, no, that's too much money. And the obvious answer would be something like, how much would you like to give? Or the amount is up to you. So. You tell me a good amount for you, and we'll be grateful for that. So you want to listen to what happens when people say no to see if there's something to work with. Third thing that happens, and you'll notice here I'm, I'm to number six where it says responding to objections. I'm starting to do that here. Sometimes people say, maybe let me think about it. I need to consider this. And rather than pressure them, I would say, OK, let's figure out a next step and how much time you need. And then I'll follow up with you later, and you'll let me know what you've decided. Finally, number seven here, close the meeting, restate any agreements so they are clear. Before you leave the room, make sure that everybody knows what's going to happen next. So this slide, the previous slide, are the structure of how we talk with donors when we meet with them to ask them for money. You can play with this structure. You can move the pieces around. I have found, and I've trained, I don't know, thousands of people that do this, is that people tend to relax when they say, OK, this is how we build this conversation. And you could turn this into a piece of paper and bring it with you, and you could use it as a cheat sheet. And that would be totally fine. Furthermore, I think it's fine to call some donors and say, we're learning how to do this. We haven't mastered this yet. We've picked a half a dozen people that we respect a lot. You're one of those people. May we come and practice on you. And you know, just so I'm clear, it's a real ask. I hope you'll give money. But more than the money, what we need is feedback. May we come and practice our donor conversation with you. You know, what I love about this is, first of all, you're, you're less stressed out because everybody knows it's practice. Secondly, you probably get a gift out of sympathy for no other reason. And third, guess who is now a member of the fundraising team? It's the donor who's helping you improve your fundraising conversation. And, and this is a form of flattery, saying to somebody, you can help us do this better. And so I encourage you to show up humble. It's like, it's OK to say, we don't know how to do this, but we're learning. Can we learn with you? I think that positions you really well. Okay. So there's a couple more steps. And then we're going to start taking questions here. Next slide, please. The accountability piece is a big deal, especially if you're working with volunteers. You need to have goals. Um, how many letters are we sending? How many phone calls are we making? How many donors are we meeting with? How many thank yous are we sending out? All that stuff. You really need to have benchmarks to measure your progress. It is good during the campaign, whether it is two weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks or whatever, to have check-in meetings either in person or by phone to get the group together and say, how are we doing? What are we hearing from donors? What are we learning? Are we getting any yeses? How much money are we raising? Those sorts of questions. Now, incentives are fun if you want to do it. And so maybe you say, OK, um, on average, we each have eight people to contact. The first person who completes at least six phone calls to t and actually talks to a donor and either gets a meeting or doesn't get a meeting you know, will buy you lunch at your favorite restaurant on your market set go. And so you know, prizes can be, certainly be overused. They don't have to be expensive. They don't have to be fancy. But you might think about what incentives will help people follow through on something if they perceive that it's going to be challenging for them. Next slide. Final step here, when the campaign is over, we want to have a party. And it could be a party for, for the staff and the board and the volunteers. It could be a party for the donors, too. 
you know, decide who, who you want to celebrate, and then we want to evaluate. So make sure you thank everybody. We do the wrap-up party. Uh, you sit down and you say, what worked, what didn't, how do we improve it next time? I think it's good to loop back to all of your donors and, and stakeholders and say, you know, we did this campaign. We set a target of meeting with uh, 40 people. We ended up meeting with 31. We got this amount of money in total, and we had a really good experience, and this is what we learned. And as noted earlier, it's good to identify the leaders for the next campaign before it starts, because then they can be preparing themselves for that. So that's pretty much the guts of how you do this. Hillary, we're going to go to the next two slides, please, and, and we'll do one at a time. And these are slides I show you, showed you earlier, but this is sort of a recap. Once you have all the pieces and you figured out what they are, you need to structure it in a way where you have a cal calendar and you have some accountability week by week. Um, next slide here. So you'll, you'll get a copy of this to work with. Um, it's coming to you as a slide deck. It's also coming to you as an exercise. The exercise is called Creating a 12-Week Major Gifts Campaign. It's from a book I did called Train Your Board and Everyone Else to Raise Money, and that'll, that'll be a free download you get as, a, as an extra incentive here. So I think we can go to the question slide, which is the next one. And let's start with chat. Um, Sky, have we had any chat questions or feedback? We don't have any chat questions yet, except for we did have one question about um, when people would get the slides. And as Andy said, we're going to be emailing out the slides and the handouts right after the presentation. And there's nothing in the question box yet either. Oh, okay. look, we have one popping in, actually. Good. Um, and you know, you, you, I know you had a question about training, which I did my best to address, but you may have other questions. You get to ask questions, too. We're going to take chat first, and then in a few minutes, we'll, we'll do our best to open up the phone if somebody wants to talk and, and give a question that way. It gets a little noisy, but we'll give it a try. But first, let's go with chat. So, so far in chat, we have nothing, but we do have three questions from Caroline in Massachusetts on the question box. OK, good. So let me unmute Caroline. And you should be live and oh. ready to go. Oh, OK, I was, was going to write them in. Um, so I have, I have a few questions. The first one is, would you say that this process is the same for institutional donors? Oh, great question. So just so we're clear about terms, just so people know, an institutional donor is any donor that's not an individual. So it might be a foundation. It might be a church. It might be a, a labor union. It might be a business. and. The answer is yes and no, in the sense that you know if you're applying to a foundation, there's an application, there's a there's an office usually, there's they have deadlines that might not meet your deadlines, so in that sense it's sort of different. On the other hand, if you're trying to raise money from, for example, local churches or local small businesses, I think the process could be very similar. What so about it's large? Sort of, what, sorry, go ahead. What about what? larger businesses, like people well, who could actually give you some money. Yeah, well, the thing about what you need to know, is, I think this came up on one of the other webinars. When we study where money comes from in this country in terms of nonprofits, 15% um, of the money given to nonprofits comes from foundations, 80% comes from individuals, only 5% comes from businesses and corporations. Okay, thanks. And People sort of assume that you know where they're going to get the money is by getting some big company to give them money. It's certainly possible. It's a whole nother topic. The short answer to your question is you want to identify somebody within the business or the corporation who is an ally and can carry water for you inside the company. And okay, so, so that was you know, that. For, yeah, for You're a, talking a about a champion. Question. That's that's what I was thinking, but I was so. Would you use this process for the champion kind of thing, and then go forward, or you know, I think you adapt this for that champion. I mean, do you have someone in mind, or you haven't haven't found that person yet? I have some people in mind. Yeah, in in larger. Well, I would um, say give it a shot. I mean, try and adapt that to adapt this to this model. So yeah, I I think I think there's enough commonality in there. You could probably make it work. Okay. That was, my, that was my first question. Now, the second question is about um, 
fundraising software, is there any online stuff like freeware or because you really from what I understand, what I've read today, you really want to start collecting a lot of information. You want to know a lot about your donors. Yeah. So, so you can manage the relationship. Um, and on, on Excel, that gets a bit unwieldy, you know? So the bad news is you get what you pay for. And okay. you can start with an off-the-shelf database program like Microsoft Access that will set you back, I don't know, $79 or something. Mm -hmm. And you can customize that and make it work for this. That's one option. And then there are relational databases built for fundraising that start at a few hundred bucks and go up to tens if not hundreds of thousands, depends on the functionality. My, my brief advice is I'd suggest, Caroline, that you identify five organizations in your area that you admire, and they don't have to be disability organizations. It could be you know, a museum or an advocacy group of another kind, environmental group, doesn't matter. And I call them up, I say, what kind of donor software do you use? Do you like it? Or is it? What can it do? And then the key question for me is, can I come and sit with you in your office for 30 minutes while you use it and see if I can make sense of it? And I would just have you do some market research with peer nonprofits and see what they're using and what they like and how much they pay for it and uh, what the customer service is like and those sorts of questions. OK, thank you. Third question. Oh, I've forgotten it. Sorry, you'll have to go on to somebody else. If I remember, I'll get back to you. All right, we'll, we'll, mute, we'll mute you and bring you back if we need to. Sky, okay, is anybody you else much. queued up? You're welcome. We do. We have another question from Tammy in New Hampshire. And Tammy is wondering, could my local advocacy group and I do a fundraising campaign during an event such as the Home Life Show? Oh, interesting. Interesting. Well, it's a different animal. It could be done. What I think you're going to have, I mean, this is, this is an event organized by somebody else. So what you have to do is go to them and say, can we use your event as a fundraising opportunity for our organization? And you know, I'm imagining this is like a trade show where there's a lot of booths and people are looking at stuff. And you could maybe set up a booth there. I don't think it's going to be a big fundraiser unless you have somebody really, really good working the table. and pulling people out and saying, hey, come learn about our important work. Hey, are you interested? I mean, you have to have some extraordinarily extroverted people to sort of grab people off the floor and talk to them. Um, so it's possible. I don't think you're going to net a lot of money for the work involved. But if you want to try it as an experiment and you have the time and the energy to do it, what the heck? Um, you know, I suppose the other thing is if there's any organized programming and you have permission to stand up and pitch to the group, that's a different sort of fundraising, but it certainly could work. Now, while we're talking, go ahead to the next slide, Hillary, because we can do this and then I'll take some more questions. I do have, I'm an author of many books, and the one on the slide is specifically about this topic. It's called How to Raise 500 to 5,000 from Almost Anyone. And it's about how to set up appointments, meet with donors, and ask in person. So that's a tool that might be useful for you if you want to go down this road. Sky, are there other questions? There are not at this point. Um, I see a couple of hands raised, but it doesn't look like people are typing in the questions. So I would encourage you to do that now. If you uh, have a question, just put it in the chat box or the question box. Yeah, I don't know if, you, I don't know if there's someone you want specifically you want to unmute. So while, while she's doing that, Hillary, let's go to the next slide, because people may want to follow up with me individually. Um, this is Topper. I had a question then, too. Sure, go for it. Um, so um, I'm really trying to embrace this, Andy. It's um, really it's getting scary, up. I know. It's so scary, because. I get it. <clears throat> all right, but I'm, I'm, we got to do this. Um, but, yep, okay, so yep. one thing I'm trying to think about, I go, to, I go to logistics, all right? So our board members, not one of them drives a car. So, so I'm just trying to think, do we, do we team them up with um, staff? Do we team them up with um, an ally? Do we just find them a, do we team up two board members and just 
find them a driver? I'm just trying to... Just... Yeah, it's a great question. So the answer is any of the above. Okay. And furthermore, you know, you can say to, you know, you could do these meetings in your office. You guys okay. have an office, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, and you could, you could, I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> A nameless organization called me last night to schedule a donor meeting, and they meet with me once a year, and I'm a donor to this organization. They're very diligent about this. And, you know, I, I will probably, they're in Montpelier too, and I'll probably just go meet them in the office because I'm in town often enough, it's easy for me to do it. So you could do it in the office, and you could invite donors there. Mm -hmm. um, you could, you know, take them to lunch, and, you know, mm -hmm. have them take you to lunch. And so there's a question about who buys, and, you know, you should probably offer to buy people lunch, but it, it doesn't mean that the, ha the transportation doesn't necessarily have to be a barrier. You can okay. you can say to the donor, you can say, you know, I'd love for you to meet with so-and-so board member who doesn't drive. Are you willing to come and meet at our office? Mm -hmm. okay, and that's one solution. But, but pairing people up is great, and maybe you do pair them up with a staff who has is, is got transportation, and you go out together. The main thing I'll do, Topper, to, to make this less stressful for you, I hope, is to say start small. I mean, yeah. pick three people that you want to try this with, or pick five people, and pick a couple of board members who are into it. And don't assume you have to roll it out as this full-blown, heavily structured campaign. You could test it a little bit and see if you get any results. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So if you start small, it'll be less overwhelming. Yeah, and then those then the board members that are that we work as a team, they can be the ones that kind of sell it to everybody else. So yeah. I right. think that's right. I think you pick a couple and you you know, you do four or five visits or whatever you can get and then you go back to the board and you say, here's what happened. You know, mm -hmm. we, we tried to meet with eight people, we got five meetings, we did the five meetings and we raised a total of twelve hundred dollars. And we're feeling pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. Like who wants to be part of this? So that, that's a great question. And, you know, it's worth noting, this is sort of obvious, but what you're seeing on the slide is me and my websites. I want to I want to tell everybody that I'll, I'll get a list of all the registrants and your email addresses soon. Hillary's very good about that. And I will send you an invitation to something called trainyourboard.com, which is the second website down here. And we do e-news, we're blogging, we're sending out lots of free training exercises. And a lot of the stuff in the blog and on the website is relevant to the conversation we're having today. So it's good backup resources. We send out e-news a couple of times a month, and you know, and we're telling people about other training opportunities and so forth. So you'll be signed up for that, and you can. It's easy to opt out if you don't want it, um, but hopefully you'll take a look at it and you'll find it useful. Um, we're just about time. Sky, is there anyone else queued up? There are. There's two questions from Brittany. One of them is, and she's sort of following up on what you had just said to Topper. She wants yep. to know if it's better to take someone out to lunch to talk about being a donor. And she's also wondering about what other, it kind of looks like what other organizations are raising money, so maybe additional resources. Oh, good question. Okay. So in terms of the lunch thing, I, I think there's sort of a hierarchy of where you meet. The first opportunity is if you can meet somebody in their home, um, that's choice number one. Uh, just because if somebody invites you into their home and they know you're coming to ask for a gift, that's a really good sign. Um, the second thing might be their office or place of business. Third option would be your office or place of business. You know, and by the way, if you guys have any good show and tell, if there's something fun to see where you work or, you know, there's some you know, I mean, I don't know if you're going to the state house and you're going to do an action or something, and you want to bring a, a donor with you. That's good stuff. So, you know, seeing your group in action, I think, is very powerful. The fourth option is going to lunch or going to the coffee shop, and if that's the best you can do, that's fine. But don't people assume that these conversations always happen in restaurants? And sometimes they do, but often they don't. One of the reasons is you can't control the environment. You know, it might be loud. Um, there's, it's often distracting. And I think the etiquette is if you do end up in a restaurant or coffee shop, um, the organization should prepare to pay for the donor's meal. Many times people say, no, no, I've got it, or let me buy you lunch, and that's lovely. And by all means, say yes and be gracious about it. Uh, other questions? I think we are all 
good on the question, but if people have them and didn't get them, then they can always email them to us and we will make sure Andy gets them or email Andy. I will Andy do my best. Them. And um, I don't know, Hillary, are there more slides about upcoming events? I don't know if there's anything else you want to preview for people. Well, here's the contact info for your organization. And this is, this is webinar number three in a series, and they've all been recorded, and they're all available. So if you're just coming to this one, um, the first one was about boards and fundraising, and the second one, I believe, was around financial management and helping board members and staff members better understand their finances. So those are all available for, for look-see if you want to look at them. Hey, Andy, I, something I wanted to share with you is that Caroline, who was on the phone earlier, she's going to work with some um, uh, other, you know, some of her, her colleagues, um, uh, and they're going to um, take the presentation you did last time and kind of just, just um, make it just a tad bit more accessible so they're going to share it with their board, and they're going to kind of keep track of how they kind of explain everything to their board members. And so when they do that, they're going to kind of create, you know, create a little package of information to share. So we'll make sure we send that your way. I am totally fine with that. Yeah, I think, I think you mean, I mean, because the, I mean, the webinar was fabulous and it, it got us, we really, really enjoyed it. It was wonderful and it's there for everyone else to enjoy. I'm just saying that some people like watching a webinar is not the best way for them to learn. So, so they're just, they're yeah, just I get that. It is, it is, you know, I have to tell you, and then we should probably wrap it, but yeah. as an instructor, this is my least favorite way to be a teacher because it's very hard to make these things interactive. I mean, people don't learn by, most people don't learn very well by listening to somebody talk and looking at slides. Yeah. And, you know, sadly it is the tool we have, but many of you, some of you have had the chance to work with me in person, and that's just a better experience all around. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I agree, and anything you can do to take this and turn it into exercises and activities and make it more accessible and usable, please, please, please do that. That's Thank important. You. Oh, yeah, go for it. Um, Sky, Hillary, Topper, thank you all for your um, help in getting these organized, and happily all the technology works, so that's great. Uh, you guys have my contact info. If somebody wants to follow up with me individually, feel free. I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andy. Thank we you. Have comments, we have comments from the audience saying thank you to you as well, so thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. On today. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great afternoon.